Thank you. How are we doing? Am I on? Mic is not on. Is it on now? No? Oh, just a minute. Give them a chance. They're, they're, give them a chance. How are we doing? Can you hear me in the back? How about if I talk like this? Can you still hear me? I'm not going to talk like this. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeffrey Smith. and um... <laughs> So you think we should switch it to the handheld mic? And... Yes. All right, here we go. You can turn this thing off. And uh, Stephen, bring you back the handheld mic. So that someone stole the handheld mic. While you guys are bringing me up the handheld mic from the back, I will start my talk. Um, first of all, what I've done for years is convince people to eat non-GMO. And we pioneered the messaging to convince, ultimately, 46% of Americans to seek non-GMO food. Information that we've created was, was shared by others and shared by others. Thank you. All right, now, can you hear me now? I feel like the, uh, the commercial for the uh, cell phone. Can you hear me now? So, oh, okay, good. You guys turned off, there you go, you turned off the wrong one. Okay, good. Um, when it Are they messing with us? You know, it's like, this is what happens in my life. They, they search me around. Just when I'm about to get on stage, they mess up the AV. You know, that's, I'm giving two talks plus a panel this week. And today's talk is a, is a oh, another. This is the non-Monsanto. OK. Look at this. Hi. This man, everyone, I don't know his name, but give him a hand. <laughs> we'll call him this man. Okay. All right, now, here we go. So I want to say that I feel, I've been doing this for 24 years, and I have spoken a thousand times in 45 countries and national television and whatnot, and I feel um, partly responsible, partly um, motivated to make sure you guys change your diet before the end of my talk, but that's not what this talk is about. So I'm brought, oh, Stephen stole the DVDs too. Oh. <laughs> Stephen walked away with the DVDs. All right, there's some DVDs out there that'll do the job, especially the most recent one called Secret Ingredients that I created with Amy Hart. It's so effective, not only at convincing you to switch to non-GMO, but also organic. Because as you'll see, you don't want to eat just the non-GMO because that's also sprayed with Roundup. All these foods are sprayed with Roundup. So now that I've said that, and I know that all of you are going to watch the film Secret Ingredients at secretingredientsmovie.com or at iTunes or Google Play, then I don't have to feel so much pressure to focus on that information so I can focus on fun stories. I have to say that fun stories in my world are how Monsanto and their minions deceive, threaten, uh, kick people out of positions, how they suppress evidence. And these stories are so important for activism. Because as I approached the subject 24 years ago, who was, who was saying that GMOs were safe? Monsanto and the FDA. So who am I to say that they're not safe? If this big corporation says it's safe, if the government says it's safe, what we need to do is to discredit those who deserve being discredited. But the best way, yes, it's true. <laughs> and as an activist, and communicator, I'm going to say one of the best ways is through stories. Stories are so effective 
And in my book, Seeds of Deception, which I released in 2003, it became the world's best-selling book on GMOs, and it stated as, as such for over a decade, because it was based on stories. And the first story was of Dr. Arpad Pustai, the leading researcher in his field. He had worked at the, at the Rowett Institute in Edinburgh and had published 300 published scientific studies and was their go-to man. He was the money magnet because he was so popular and the top person in his field. He would be getting all these different grants and researches to do. So he was working there and he won out over 27 competitors to get the grant from the UK government to figure out how to test for the safety of GMOs. And working with people in three different institutes and about 30 people, he took the concept of genetic engineering and wrote the protocols. And those protocols were supposed to be used by the European Union to figure out if GMOs were safe. And as part of his research, he took perfectly harmless, genetically engineered potatoes, engineered to produce an insecticide, and he put them through the rat feeding protocol. Now, he knew that this insecticide was safe. It was a lectin, and he was the world's experts in lectin. He started the world's, he started that category of science, and it was the lectin he knew more about than anyone, any other lectin. And he knew it was safe. So when the potato, it's a little bit of feedback here, when the potato was engineered to produce this lectin as an insecticide, he was like, oh, it's so safe. We don't really need to test it. But when they did test it, they found that the rats developed pre potentially precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains, livers and testicles, partial atrophy of the liver, and damaged immune system in just 10 days. You can see the, in the intestinal walls on the, on the right side, the rats that were fed genetically modified potatoes. Now, what was interesting about his research is that he fed one group of rats the genetically engineered potatoes that were producing this insecticide. He fed another group of rats the same natural potatoes and the same balanced diet in addition to the potatoes. But he fed a third group of rats natural potatoes, but the, that their meals were spiked with the same amount of the insecticide that the GMO potatoes were producing. So you had GMO, non-GMO, and non-GMO plus a little spray of the insecticide. Only those that ate the genetically modified potato got sick. So it wasn't the insecticide. It was somehow the process of genetic engineering, the generic process, the same process that was being used to create the genetically modified crops being eaten in the UK at the same time. And when I talked to Dr. Arpad Pustai about what was his most shocking moment, and I'll tell you some more shocking moments, but in his, in his story, the most shocking moment came, came right after he discovered all of this. He was asked by his director, Professor Philip James. James walked into his office and put about six or 700 pages down on his desk and said, the Minister of Agriculture needs a scientific opinion on these because he's voting in Brussels about GMOs. And Arpad, Pustai, the scientist, looked at James and knew that James had these secret, confidential submissions because he was on the 12-member committee to review them. Our pot also told me that he knew James would never read these pages. He was not a working scientist. He was a committee man, as were the other 11 members of his committee. So he realized when he looked at these stacks that probably no one had actually ever read them. And he was supposed to read them to give him a scientific opinion because James hadn't read them and now it was needed by the Minister of Agriculture. So Arpad said, how much time do we have? And James said, two hours, two and a half hours. <laughs> 
So Arpad and his scientist wife divided him up and they looked at the two things, the design and the results. And he said, reading those studies, Jeffrey, was the most shocking moment in my life because I realized what, they were, what we were doing was science. What they were doing was as little as possible to get their foods on the market as quickly as possible. But it was really very poor research. It was bad science. And he described to me all the things that they didn't do that needed to be done. How these foods could be incredibly dangerous. And he spoke to the minister and he said, you know, I wasn't expecting to give a strong opinion after just two and a half hours, but I have to say there's not enough information to allow these foods to be put on the market. The minister said, I don't know why you're saying this. Those foods are already on the market. They've been on the market for two years. This was a shock. They had been feeding the, these genetically modified foods to the population for two years. And then when Arpad got these results from his rats, he realized that the GMOs on the market were created from the same process, but they never checked the immune system. They never weighed the organisms. They never did real biochemical research in terms of the blood. They didn't do his, th these type of slides. In other words, since they were created from the same process, they could be creating the same problems, but no one in the world had ever looked. So these, this same slide could be defining what's happening in the human gut. When he discovered the issues, he was very concerned. And around the same time, he was invited to speak, lost, he was invited to speak on a UK TV show. And with permission from Professor Philip James, the director, he went and was interviewed. They knocked it down to two and a half minutes. And he basically said that he didn't think it would be good, was a good idea to use the population as guinea pigs. And that he personally would not eat it. And he was the leading scientist in the world in his field. The, the one who was probably the most qualified to evaluate the submissions by the biotech industry because he had just spent years figuring out how to evaluate the safety of GMOs. And he said, completely worthless evaluations done by the industry and completely dangerous in terms of the process. He got back to his institute and his professor, Philip James, was like all excited because there was tremendous publicity. And this was a way that the Rowett Institute could get some more money and some more research. And he diverted all of the phone calls that were supposed to go to Arpad Pustai to his desk so he could talk about how great the research was. And he even put out his own press release without even talking to Arpad and it was wrong. But then the next afternoon, two phone calls were placed from the UK Prime Minister's office, forwarded through the receptionist to Professor James. We had heard also that it was Monsanto that called Bill Clinton. And Bill Clinton who called Tony Blair. And Tony Blair's office called Philip James. And the next day, Arpod was, was fired. He was silenced with threats of a lawsuit. They withdrew the data. They never implemented his safety protocols. He still had to stick around for his contract. He had nothing to do. He had to sit. No one would sit with him in the dining hall. It was like complete, complete horror. And seven months and one heart attack later, he was invited to speak before parliament. And so he would, they, forced, they were forced to give him his data back. And he spoke before them. His research was published in The Lancet and other publications, and it was the most in-depth animal feeding studies ever conducted on GMOs, and it showed that the generic process of genetic engineering was unsafe. But during the seven months when he was unable to speak, there was a massive effort to discredit him, and they put out incredibly inaccurate lies and disinformation so that people didn't know what to do. So the reality of his discovery 
never took hold. Because if it had, GMOs would have been eliminated from the food supply on the spot. Now, his sacrifice, his, I've asked him, would you do it again? He said, I'm a scientist. I am empirical scientist. I go with what's a fact. And he also pointed out, he said, you know, after I spoke out, they took GMOs out of Europe. That happened. I opened my book with it. Let's, let's give a hand to Arpad Pustai. <laughs> Amazing man. I opened my book, Seeds of Deception, in the moment that the doorbell rang at his home. He had been unable to speak for seven months. Susan, his wife, answered the door, and there was like 30 reporters, either right in front of them, running from their cars or parking. She said, we can't speak about what would happen. We would be sued. It's okay, the reporter from Channel 4 TV uh, said, waving the paper in front of her. They released your husband. He could speak. He gave her the, the thing. She called for Arpod. Arpod came out. He started reading it. There it was. The gag order was lifted. While he was reading, the 30 reporters slipped behind Susan and sat in the, sat in the living room. And he was able to speak for the first time. And over 700 articles were written about GMO safety within a month in the UK. Within the first week, one editor said, it, does, it divided society into two warring blocks. There were two UK newspapers that were taking a stand against GMOs, one or two for GMOs, back and forth, back and forth. Ten weeks after the gag order, April 27th, after the gag order was lifted, Unilever, Britain's largest food company, publicly announced no more GMOs in Europe. The next day, Nestle's, no more GMOs in Europe. The next week, no more GMOs in Europe. These same companies continued to sell GMOs to the unsuspecting U.S. population because this whole Arpad Pustai affair was described as one of the 10 most underreported events of the year by Project Censored. So information was critical in stopping GMOs. And it was a high-profile headline scandal. And it was a story. How he was beaten up, essentially, fired, and ultimately vindicated. So it was the stories that carry the weight. And so the, the book, Seeds of Deception, weaves the health dangers into these stories which is why it was so effective and why I'm enjoying so much the opportunity to give a full lecture just on stories of deception. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's like the Monsanto playbook. Whoops. Here's the stomach lining, by the way. It's even worse. And these, these particular pictures, they're in my second book, Genetic Roulette. A friend of mine, who I didn't know at the time, Dr. Michelle Perro was looking at these pictures and an alarm went off and said, oh my God, I now understand. She's a pediatrician, one of the top in the country, named as such for years. And in the early 2000s, there were all of a sudden a raft of very complicated new diseases that she wasn't seeing before. The same remedies were no longer working. She couldn't figure it out. Her colleagues were having the same issue. She looked at this and said, this is what's happening in the guts of the children. This was the fear of Dr. Arpad Pustai. So she put all of her children and families on organic diets, and things reversed. In fact, the film Secret Ingredients, which she is in, is about individuals and families who switch to organic and Autistic kids are no longer on the spectrum. Infertile couples have children. People with skin problems, cancer, allergies, uh, brain fog, brain fog. <laughs> that was a joke. Um, <laughs> all sorts of diseases and, and conditions went away. And it wasn't just because we happened to pick these people who had something else going on, because it was repeated over and over again in her practice, in the practice of David Perlmutter, who's in the film, in others. So that's why that film is so impactful, 
because it's stories, emotional stories that make you cry. And then you have the scientific evidence weaved in to explain why the GMOs and the Roundup were contributing to the autism, the paralysis, the tumors, the brain fog. And you understand the specific neurotransmitters that go out, the microbiome that gets attacked, the mitochondria. You understand that so you get permission to believe the stories that you're reading and watching. So that gives, them, that gives the, the mind the ability to say, yes, this is true, because now you understand it. And then you have the commitment. So I'm sharing this as part of the tactics and strategy that I've used for 24 years. And so now I'm going to give you some stories that you can share. Here's a story. Genetically engineered bovine growth hormone. Remember that? Injected into a cows to increase milk supply. It's Santo. Okay, Santo's here. It's still in some dairies, but most kicked out because of the massive education program. I talked to a former. I talked to a former. I talked to a former. I'm gonna just find different spots on the thing. Now the person with the camera is really confused. Hello. I talked to a former Monsanto scientist, and he said that three of his colleagues were testing the milk from cows treated with the company's bovine growth hormone. And they found so much of a cancer-promoting hormone called IGF-1, the three Monsanto scientists refused to drink milk thereafter unless it was organic. One bought his own cow. Now, you see how much fun it is to tell that story? Say, See, Monsanto really doesn't want, you know. <laughs> Maybe you can bring me both, both microphones. Um, you see, if you could say that Monsanto's own scientists refused to drink milk after they tested it because of the cancer-promoting hormone they, fa they found, and one bought his own cow, that's interesting and that's memorable. But if you simply say, I wouldn't eat that, it causes cancer, or there's research that causes cancer, the response could be, oh, yeah, everything causes cancer. You see? So I'm, I'm helping you in whatever, whatever activism you do, create stories. Here's another story, okay? One of my favorites about bovine growth hormone. So they wanted to approve it at the FDA because the FDA was mandated to promote GMOs. So they were waiting for this one study that was done by Monsanto's friends, Monsanto's scientists and Monsanto's friends. And they injected cows not with Monsanto's bovine growth hormone, but another company's that never went on the market at 2% the dose that Monsanto uses. And they found that there was a, uh, I think a 27% increase in bovine growth hormone in the milk. And they said, wasn't substantial. Now it's a hormone and any increase in hormone is serious, but they said it wasn't substantial. But then they said, it really doesn't matter because 90%, this is what the FDA said, 90% of the hormone is destroyed during pasteurization. You can see it's found in that research study. So if you look at the research study, you realize that what they did is they pasteurized the milk 120 times longer than normal. But they only destroyed 19%, not 90, 1, 9, 19. So they added powdered hormone to the milk, 143 times the natural occurring level. Just poured it in, poured it in, poured it in. Then pasteurized it 120 times longer than normal. Under those conditions, they destroyed 90% of the hormone. And that's what the FDA reported. You can see how they rig their research. Now, when you realize that they're doing that, are you going to believe anything else that they say? No. So again, these stories are so important because they're what we needed to discredit Monsanto and to discredit the FDA. Someone wanted to discredit the FDA? Steve Drucker, are you in the audience here? Where are you, Steve? He'll be here tomorrow night in a panel with me. 
He pioneered a lawsuit which forced the FDA to turn over 44,000 secret internal memos. And the story that came out of that was the overwhelming consensus among the scientists working at the FDA were that GMOs were different and dangerous and needed to be tested, even human toxicological tests, because it could create allergens, toxins, new diseases, and nutritional problems. But the person in charge of policy at the FDA was Monsanto's former attorney, Michael Taylor. And when he wrote the policy, he systematically took out the concerns of the scientists. So one scientist said, What's, this is just a political document. It has none of, the, none of the side effects that we talked about. And the final policy, which is still in effect today, says the agency is not aware of any information showing that the foods created by these new methods differ from other foods in any meaningful or uniform way. A total lie. How do we know? Because we have the FDA scientists saying the exact opposite. Saying it is, the tech, it is the opinion of the technical experts in the agency that the process of genetic engineering and traditional breeding are different and lead to different risks. And by trying to force the conclusion that there's no difference is like forcing a square peg into a round hole, unquote. Completely lied in the policy. Denying, denying the concerns by the scientists. Pretending they didn't exist. And so just hearing that, Someone could say, oh, so they can't rely on the FDA. They can't rely on Monsanto. In 30 seconds, we've just discredited the two main spokespeople for the health dangers, for the health safety of GMOs. In story format. Oh, let's add the fact that Michael Taylor, after working at the FDA on Monsanto's behalf and also approved bovine growth hormone, went to Monsanto to become their vice president. And then later back to the FDA become the U.S. food czar. So this, in one 30-second story, we've just removed the power of multi-millions of dollars of advertising and people, oh, well, the FDA says it's safe. Well, the scientists didn't say it's safe. It was the political appointees. You can go more into those, that story if you want. Now, here's a story, interesting. There was an article that wanted to, a scientific article published in a British journal that said, when consumers in Canada were given full information, they, choose to, they chose to eat the genetically engineered corn. It never mentioned this one little fact that above the non-GMO corn was a sign that said, would you eat wormy sweet corn? This was designed by a pro-GMO person. It was rigged research designed to give the wrong impression, designed to give the impression that people, are, that people prefer eating GMO corn. And not only did they say, would you eat wormy sweet corn, they listed all of the pesticides and herbicides that were used on the wormy sweet corn. And then the, the GMO corn had no sign over it. And the scientist doing this objective research, he saw someone leave the store with the natural sweet corn and ran up to them and convinced them that they made the wrong decisions. Oh, okay, next time I'll try the GMO corn. This was how he conducted. And never mentioned any of this in the peer-reviewed journal. And there was a pro-GMO British uh, a scientific journal. How do we know? Because it won award as the, one of the best articles of the year. And then when all of this came out in a book, the fact that there was the Would You Eat Wormy Sweet Corn, it was actually published in a book by a reporter with the picture of the sign and a description of how the author had tried to, had actually run up to people to try and convince them. The journal did not retract the paper or the award. It tells you that they're basically being controlled by the biotech industry. Well, we'll get to that. So part of the solution is educating people about the health dangers and shifting to non-GMO, but non-GMO is not good enough, organic, because of the Roundup sprayed on the non-GMO. And tomorrow, what I'm going to speak on is a bigger danger, an existential threat to the whole planet from GMOs, 
which you don't want to miss that because that, that, that is something that is so intense and so important that I think everyone needs to hear about this all over the world and there are solutions that we need to develop for that too. So he, there was a study done in 1996 by Monsanto. You don't have to read the, the screen, it's too much. Um, 1996, Journal of Nutrition, Monsanto did one scientific study on GMO soy. And basically the title was that there's no difference. It's substantially equivalent, GM and non-GM soy. And that was all they put out in 1996, and people were eating it in 1997. Nothing else. It has been described as the model of how you do research to avoid finding problems. They diluted their GM soy tenfold. They used too much protein so that there wouldn't be any results in the rats from protein deficiency. Here's an example of how they did their work. When you're doing side-by-side -side comparisons for content, you know, what's the composition? You go into the same climate, the same geography, you, you have a line in the field, one side's GMO, one side's non-GMO, the snuff separation distance, so there's no contamination, but you hold all of the other factors, all the other variables constant, so you're just looking at the only difference, not weather, not location, and then you'll have statistical significance. You lower the noise. So, what did Monsanto do? They had six different side-by-side -side studies all over the country, and then they pooled all of the data. By pooling all of the data, they eliminate the statistical significance of on almost anything that's not extreme. And they still had at some extreme outliers like reduced or increased trypsin inhibitor, which is an allergen, and some other things. And Barbara Keeler, who was an investigative reporter and medical writer, contacted the Journal of Nutrition and found that Monsanto had submitted data that never made it into the paper and was able to find the data where they did actually side-by-side -side comparisons in Puerto Rico. And they found that there was, with cooked GM soy, as much as a seven-fold increase in trypsin inhibitor. Trypsin inhibitor inhibits trypsin, which breaks down protein. If you have proteins lasting longer in your gut, they have a greater capacity to create allergic reactions. It may be why, we don't know, in the five years after GM soy was introduced, peanut allergies doubled. Because if you're not able to break down the peanut protein, you may get an allergic reaction. There's also a cross-reactivity between soy and peanuts that might have been enhanced in the GM version. We don't know. But trypsin inhibitor, being in such high levels, could be a disaster for the entire digestive tract and immune system. And that information was hidden. It was in the archives of the journal, never published. She found it, and she published it with Mark LaPay in the Los Angeles Times, along with the fact that there was an anti-nutrient that was doubled, something that blocks the absorption of other nutrients, a reduction in protein, a reduction in other key elements of nutrition. And why were these left out? Because remember, the name of the study was that they are substantially equivalent. If this information had been put into the article, it would have proven the opposite and maybe the soy would never have been introduced. The only reason they got the soy approved is because they used rigged research. When they tested the feed, they created Roundup Ready Soy designed to be sprayed with Roundup. They never sprayed it with Roundup before they fed it to animals. No one grows Roundup Ready Soy and doesn't spray it with Roundup. That's why you grow it. And originally it was being sprayed twice. Now it's being sprayed four times in some places tenfold number amount of glyphosate or Roundup. And they never even sprayed it. It was, it was described as a typical way, a perfect example of what you do in order using the wrong statistical methods, the wrong controls, the wrong methods in order to avoid finding problems. And this was the study upon which GMO soy was introduced to our food supply. 
Now, Mark LePay, the co-author of that letter, he wrote a book called Against the Grain. And while it was waiting for publication, Monsanto was concerned that he had heard that he had blown the whistle on the fact that their genetically modified soy had a lower amount of phytoestrogens, which are good for the heart. So they wrote a they wrote a nasty letter asking him, basically demanding that he not publish the book. And then they said in a sentence, and there's no difference in the phytoestrogens level. Now, Mark had no idea why. I said, well, I guess, well, let's check it. It was like they tipped their hand. They never realized that Mark had not tested for phytoestrogen levels, but when they wrote him the letter, he did. And sure enough, there was a lower level of phytoestrogen levels. So he was ready to publish that. And he had, to do, he had to not talk about it for a while while it was waiting to be published. So Monsanto used that period, did their own research, and immediately published their own study, which said there's so much variability in phytoestrogens, you can't even do a statistical analysis. So it came out before Mark's article came out, nullifying the results. But Mark realized that Monsanto went to the same laboratory that he went to to do their study. So he went to that one guy who was the world's expert at extracting and testing for phytoestrogen levels. And he said, what gives? And the scientist said, yeah, Monsanto forced us to use an obsolete method of detection that was prone to variability. So they designed the study specifically to have no statistical results. They forced it out into the public domain. They never mentioned in their peer-reviewed journal that they had used the absolute, me absolute method, and the person at the laboratory was not allowed to publish anything saying that either. So this is exactly how they rigged their research. So when you say, when you go and say, oh, tobacco says this, big tobacco says this, uh, drug companies say this, Monsanto says this, see, it's in black and white, it's actually published, it could be absolutely meaningless. And we'll explain a little bit how they do their work. So Monsanto had to pull the high lysine corn submittal when it was being submitted to the European Union because they asked some questions and Monsanto didn't want to answer those questions. And they had originally submitted it to the Australian New Zealand board and they approved it. But I had written up about it. I interviewed Dr. Jack Heinemann who had done a, a scathing research study about it. I summarized what he did, put it in my book. And I found this this morning when I was preparing some of the slides. I found this. I had never seen this before about the hyalysine corn withdrawal. I'm going to go to this next page. You're not going to be able to read the details. It said, European Food Safety Authority was forced to take it seriously because of concerns from a large number of European countries, including Finland and Malta. The scientific basis of the concerns were highlighted in Jeffrey Smith by Jeffrey Smith in his book, Genetic Roulette, and by Professor Jack Heinemann in his book, Hi Hope Not Hype. So I ended up not realizing that my book influenced the withdrawal of this very dangerous high lysine corn. Thank you very much. <laughs> I had no idea. And it describes how they had rigged their research, false assumptions, failure to offer a test results based on cooked or processed corn, fa failure to test. Monsanto, hey. Failure to test the whole GM plant and feeding trials, confusing and contradictory characterizations, fraudulent mixing of GM strains, pooling of crop data, undesirable effects in experiments, feeding trials too short, uh, changing the animal tissues, choice of an irrelevant, unrelated corn variety as the control group by comparison with the GM lines. It was the clear intention of hiding potentially serious differences. I mean, Jack Heinemann did a brilliant job of breaking it down, and then I took his, like, 300 pages of, of, of materials and brought out, like, a story. I brought out a story, and that's what the regulators in Finland and, and uh, uh, where else, Malta? No. Malta apparently read. The, the condensed version. So yeah, there's a value to taking even clear scientific evidence, but if it's hidden behind hundreds of pages, it needs to be turned into a story. So here's one story from, see, you won't remember high lysine corn. That's not, it's too, it's too vague. So I want to tell you a story to help you remember this high lysine corn. They wanted to create corn 
with extra levels of lysine because when you feed pigs, you have to throw lysine in the feed as well. So why don't we have the corn produce? So they genetically engineered genes into the corn that produces the lysine. And they said that the lysine protein that's used in the corn, that's created in the corn, it has a history of safe use in the, in the human food supply because it's in soil. And we have soil residues on food, right? We have some soil residues on food. And so because there's soil residues on food and we eat those soil residues, it means it has a history of safe use and doesn't need to be tested. This is their logic. So Jack Heinemann, a brilliant scientist, decided to call their bluff and said, OK, how much, how much corn does an average male American eat? Uh, this is going to tell me how to hold the mic. Now, the, the, phone, that's not, the phone's not up. Um, if, we have, if you have an average male American, how much corn do they eat per day? And if it were Monsanto's high lysine variety, how much of that protein would they be consuming per day? How much of that protein is found in soil? How much soil would they have to consume per day for this to, to consume the same amount of high lysine protein that they would consume in the average day of corn consumption? It turns out that the average male American would have to consume in terms of the amount of soil, 22,000 pounds per second. <laughs> Back up the dump trucks and force 22,000 pounds of soil into American every second of a day, and then they would have as much of, of that protein as they would eat in a typical corn day. And this is the kind of faulty assumptions <laughs> that Monsanto uses. One of my favorites, because the image is so hard to get out of your mind, you know? So this is an example of the absurdity of, of Monsanto's corporate science. So there's a scientist named uh, Irina Ermakova. She gave me the following few slides when we were speaking together at the European Parliament. And these are rat livers on the right that were fed GM soy, and the rats on the left were fed non-GM soy. And you could see the changes in them. We now know that tiny levels of glyphosate cause fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is now uh, an epidemic with 30% of, of Americans experiencing it. It's a, it can lead to more serious issues like liver cancer. She also did a study um, where she found that the testicles of rats changed from pink to blue when they were fed genetically engineered soy. I like to leave this image on for a minute while I take a slow drink of water. To burn it in the minds of people and to affect half the audience. <laughs> and she also uh, fed these rats genetically modified soy. These are female rats, they're Russian speaking rats. Uh, fed them GM soy starting two weeks before they got pregnant and continued through pregnancy and lactation, and more than half of their babies died within three weeks, compared to 10% when the mother rats ate non-GM soy. Well, as you could imagine, and also, by the way, they were smaller and could not reproduce. She was attacked viciously. She was a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. She lost her job and was unable to find similar work after that. This is the kind of impact that Monsanto has around the world. I'm just giving percentage, I'm giving you a small percentage of the um, stories that I know about and have collected. And some of them more recently come from the Monsanto trials. I want to say I am so pleased that the results of the first three Roundup trials where plaintiffs were accusing Monsanto of causing their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, that Monsanto lost and the juries awarded them $2.3 billion. <laughs> now,
Now, the judges reduced it to $190 million from $2.3 billion, but that's still a heavy chunk of change. And the last official count for the number of plaintiffs waiting for their day in court was 42,700, but unofficial estimates put it at about 100,000. So the, the recent evidence, the recent report now is that the lawyers are talking to Bayer, which owns Monsanto, and to do a settlement. And there's one lawyer who I know who's holding out because he thinks that he should get more for his clients. But it can go either way in the next few days. There is a, uh, a trial going on now in St. Louis that will be televised. So you can go online and, and Google it and find out how to get to the Monsanto St. Louis Roundup trial and have incredible entertainment. Um, and I'm going to share some of the, and I, we have even more entertainment, I mean real entertainment of stories from the lead attorney who won two of the three cases. His name is Brent Wisner, and we interview him at responsibletechnology.org. Monsanto does not like Brent Wisner. It could be someone's phone. If someone's phone is not on airplane mode in the front, you may want to put it in airplane mode. In fact, putting your phone, not just turning it off, doesn't stop the transmissions. You got to put it in airplane mode before you shut it off, and then, it, or even just airplane mode without shutting it off, and it stops the transmissions. So if you want to get some really amazing stories, dramatic, better than watching those courtroom, docu courtroom uh, uh, movies, watch my interview with Brent Wisner at responsibletechnology.org. And that's where you can also make a donation, as, as it was recommended by So one thing we know is that the discredit bureau that I have been fighting and reporting on really exists. It's a budget item. And it calls, it's called Let Nothing Go. That's their program. Not a single tweet, not a single post, certainly not a scientist discovering problems, certainly not Jeffrey Smith writing an article. Let Nothing Go was their policy. It's like scorched earth policy. And they had front groups and fake scientists and, and trolls all going after anyone that came out with a statement against GMOs or Roundup or Monsanto. So if you look at how they got Roundup with its active ingredient glyphosate on the market, and there's a lot of details here. You don't have to read it. I'll just tell you the story. There's a company called Industrial Biotest Laboratories that was, they actually were doing 35 to 40 percent of all toxicological tests in the country. And the Justice Department who investigated said, one person said, it was the place to go because everyone knew they'd get their products passed. How'd they get their products passed? Because it was fraudulent. They did 22,000 toxicological studies, including 10,000 that were used for agricultural chemicals, 2,000 of which were considered the primary studies that resulted in allowing 325 insecticides and herbicides to move forward. And when they actually looked at the research over years and years, they found that maybe 10% were valid and the rest were fraud. And that most of those same pesticides continue to be sprayed on the fields. So what kind of fraud? In some, store, in some studies, 80% of the rats died and were replaced. The rat evaluations of those that died didn't exist. They would sometimes cut and paste information from one study and put it into another. They do two-year studies in eight months. They talked about doing evaluations of the uteri of male rats. You know, it's, they were completely, completely incompetent. I read 20 pages of it yesterday in preparation for this talk. It was like, yeah, it was absolutely disgusting what was going on in this laboratory. And it turns out that three people went to jail including Dr. Paul Wright, who had worked for Monsanto as a toxicologist, and then went to IBT to oversee some of the studies for Monsanto, then went back to Monsanto, and while he was back at Monsanto, he was being indicted and went to jail. And 11 of the 19 chronic toxicological studies of glyphosate were performed by IPT fraudulently, and uh, even after that, when it was considered invalidated, more recently, 
a report by the EPA cited the IBT studies as reasons why it approved Roundup, not mentioning that it had been invalidated. Uh, later in the EPA, they were given a research study by Monsanto where it was clear that a low dose caused a particular tumor and a higher dose caused more tumors. And the control group had no tumors. And so they said, we're going to call it a possible carcinogen in 1985, which could have stopped the commercialization of Roundup. So what happened was Monsanto needed the EPA to reverse it and argued over and over again, what can we do to reverse it? So eventually, they, you can read from the memos made public from the lawsuit. In a 1985 memo uh, from Monsanto's George Lev Levenkos, he said that they were going to hire Dr. Marvin Kushner, who will review the kidney sections and present his evaluation to persuade the agency that the observed tumors are not related to glyphosate. Kushner had never seen the slides before. He had never been given the data. But here, the person from Monsanto was telling another executive what Kirshner would, f would find. Because that same Levin Levinskis tried to downplay a study earlier about Monsanto's PCBs, so he knew how to rig the research. And Dr. Kushner looked at the controls and circled something and said, see, there's a tumor in the controls. No one else looking at it saw a tumor. None of the EPA scientists said, there's a real tumor there. He just circled an area and said, there's a tumor here, which would cause lack of statistical significance and invalidate the study. So they argued and argued for years, and eventually the EPA gave up and declared it not a carcinogen. And yet the World Health Organization's Institute for International uh, Agency for Research on Cancer used the same study to support its evidence that it causes cancer. They also then were getting a lot of pressure because they were saying glyphosate causes cancer because it's genotoxic, meaning it damages the, the DNA. So Monsanto hired Dr. James Parry, the world's expert at genotoxicity, and said, look at these four studies and tell us what you find. And he looked at the four studies and said, yep, looks like it's genotoxic. They looked back and said, wait a minute, look at all of these studies. He said, yep, that increases the evidence. It certainly looks like it's genotoxic. Monsanto's internal memos made public from a lawsuit, quote, we want to find slash develop someone who is comfortable with the genotox profile of glyphosate Roundup and who can be influential with regulators and scientific outreach operations. Uh, we, my read is that Parry is not currently such a person, and it would take some time and money to get him there. And he said, we simply aren't going to do the studies that Parry suggests. He suggested to do all those studies. They ignored that. They ignored that. One, one, edit, one, science, one um, edit, uh, executive wrote, has Dr. Parry ever done research for industry before? In other words, doesn't he know he's not supposed to find these findings? So what did Monsanto do? They were supposed to legally turn over the findings to the EPA. They broke the law, hid the study, and then ghost wrote their own study as a review paper, hired scientists to sign it, and the conclusion was just the opposite to what Perry found, that there was no genotoxicity. We found in the, in the documents to the EPA, that Marion Copley, who was a 30-year senior toxicologist, wrote a letter to Jess Rowland, who was the head of the committee that was evaluating whether glyphosate causes cancer. Glyphosate's the chief poison in Roundup. And it was a letter that did not hold back. She had cancer. She was dying. She had to leave the EPA. And she said she needed to do this before she died. And she listed 14 ways that glyphosate could promote cancer. And she said, any one of these mechanisms alone could cause tumors, but glyphosate causes all of them. And that it's certain that glyphosate causes cancer. She said, 
to Jess Rowland, don't play your political conniving games with the science to favor the registrants, meaning Monsanto. For once, do the right thing and don't make decisions based on how it affects your bonus. You and Anna Lowett intimidate staff on the Cancer Committee and changed final reports to favor industry. Just promise me never to let Anna on CAR Committee. Her decisions don't make rational sense. If anyone in the Office of Pesticides uh, Programs is taking bribes, it is her. So she did not hold back. So what did Jess Rowland do? Jess Rowland, it turns out, was Monsanto's lapdog. He tipped off Monsanto months before he was, they were supposed to know that the, in, that the International Agency for Research on Cancer was doing an analysis of, of glyphosate and carcinogenicity, giving them the chance to prepare their defense. Um, he also told Monsanto executives that there was another agency in the government that was going to do an evaluation of glyphosate and carcinogenicity, and he was determined to stop them. And he said, if I can kill this, I should get a medal, and it was killed. And some other comments going back and forth between people at the FDA verify that Jess was doing a nice job, that maybe he can help us after he retires. And then, mysteriously, a non-final report on the glyphosate uh, analysis. Wait, wait. This has stopped working. Okay, so he oversaw the committee that determined that glyphosate did not cause cancer. The report appeared on the website for the, for the EPA before it was supposed to be put there. No one knows how it got there. It was immediately copied by Monsanto and sent to the press and sent to regulators, and then it was taken down with an apology, and a few days later, Roland left the EPA. So we think it was him. Now, an analysis of how Roland's committee found that glyphosate did not cause cancer when the World Health Organization's committee did was published in a peer-reviewed journal. The World Health Organization used peer-reviewed published studies that had an overwhelming evidence of cancer. In Roland's committee, they relied almost exclusively on Monsanto studies. And we're seeing how Monsanto conducts their studies. No wonder. And they also av they avoided studies that used the whole formulation. They just focused on glyphosate. Even though Roundup, which has a lot of other ingredients, some that are a thousand times more toxic than glyphosate, that Roundup as a whole can be 125 times more toxic than glyphosate alone and that Roundup as a whole has a lot of evidence of causing cancer. But the EPA doesn't have to look at the whole formulation because their rules are designed by industry. So they just look at... So when Roland tipped off Monsanto, they created a whole plan. And the documents of that plan became public because of this lawsuit. It's been such a valuable trove of information. And the purpose of the plan was to orchestrate outcry. This was before IARC, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, issued its results. So Monsanto did not even know what the results were, but they knew the research and could anticipate that they were going to be determining that it was either a carcinogen or a probable carcinogen. And so they created, they used their front groups, they decided to ghostwrite specific uh, articles to have an independent, count, uh, quote, independent counsel review. They had created third-party social media posts. They had growers associations on board, opinion leaders, etc. They planned all this, the same tactics that I have been reporting on for years. But we have it all. I mean, this was gold for us. It's like, yeah, we know they do all of these things. But here it was in their own handwriting. And here's where we, okay. And so, for example, they had an expert panel review whether it causes cancer. And one person, 
One scientist said, I can't be a part of a deceptive authorship on a presentation or publication. We call that ghostwriting, and it is unethical. So one person stood up to them, but others on the committee did not. And we have, in fact, the consulting agreement and how much money changed hands with someone who was supposed to be an independent person. And the document said, never influenced by Monsanto, even though we see evidence that people in Monsanto actually wrote the critique and rewrote it and insisted that their, their lapdogs um, do what they said so that when they published it, it was Monsanto's words. They also described in their own emails, we ghostwrite. Recall, it said, we just edit it and, and we, the, the, the scientists just edit it and sign their names. And he said, recall that's how we handled Williams, Crows, and Monroe 2000. The Williams, Crows, Monroe 2000 is probably that review paper that they wrote instead of issuing the Parry Report which is being cited by regulatory agencies all over the world showing that glyphosate doesn't cause cancer. They're admitting that they wrote it. In fact, Monsanto scientist David Saltmiras acknowledged when he was describing what he did during the year, yep, ghost wrote cancer review paper. And he even tried to argue that he wanted to have his name on it because he wanted some credit, because he's been doing this for two years. For two years, he's been ghostwriting, and he wanted some credentials. But they said, no, we can't have Monsanto uh, authoring anything that is favorable of glyphosate, so they kept his name out of it. They had um, a guy named Henry Miller, Miller submit an article to Forbes that had been drafted by Monsanto. When it became public, Forbes took it off their website and everything else that, that Miller had written. He was one of Monsanto's lapdogs at the FDA. I was uh, invited to speak on the Doctors TV show, which is a national TV show with millions of viewers, just after the IARC determined that glyphosate caused cancer. And I was asked if I could debate the uh, Monsanto toxicologist, Donna Farmer. Now, Monsanto has a long-term policy of never debating me. In fact, they won't even be on the same stage, and sometimes they won't even appear on the same conference. So when I, the last time I was on Dr. Oz, I was speaking with a doctor, interviewed by Dr. Oz, and then he turned to the camera and said, we're going to do something that we've never done before. Jeffrey Smith is so controversial that the other side will not appear on stage with him. So we're going to ask them to leave, and then we're going to interview a scientist who's going to defend Roundup. So we left and went to the green room and watched her give lie after lie after lie after lie, and it was so obvious why she didn't want us on stage, because we would have pointed out that everything she said was false. And they had to do what was called a pickup because something didn't get recorded right. So they gave us a chance to answer one question again. And so we knew what she had said after we spoke because it would be edited into the part before she spoke. And so we got a chance to give the truth about something that she was lying about. And that got them so angry. They wrote letters saying, you did this on purpose. You're working with Jeffrey Smith. You're biased. And it was totally not true. In fact, they, they attacked me. They, they try and do an entire, you know, detective work on me, private detective investigation. And all they could find out was that I like to dance and that I meditate. And while I was writing my book, Seeds of Deception, I was teaching people in my town how to swing dance. So they go, oh, now we have the angle. He's a dance teacher. And so when they tried to do a hit piece on, in The New Yorker against um, Dr. Oz, then one of their paid people, Bruce Chassie, who has received a lot of money to try and go after me, said basically, you know, that, and do, one of the reasons why we can't trust Dr. Oz is he had dance teacher Jeffrey Smith on, who's just a, a meditation teacher, and it's like, you know, this is how, this is what they get. You know, this is how far they go. 
So I, I was on TV. Donna got the last word. And she said, I mean this very honestly. She was obviously had media training over and over again and had practiced all these lines and smiling and just, she had definitely, I mean, the media training is very important for the people in Monsanto, years and years of it. I mean this very honestly. I am extremely highly confident that this product as a mom, and I could back it, confident in this product as a mom, and I could back it up as a scientist. So then when the scientists, when the, when the, Lawyers got all these millions of documents and posted many of them on the website. I searched under Donna Farmer's name and found that in private she wasn't so confident. And I called the producers of the doctors and I said, guess what? We have evidence that Donna Farmer wasn't being confessed. Oh. And so I sent them the quotes and I said, I'd also like to introduce you to an attorney, Brent Wisner, and a plaintiff that he's representing, so we can have a full package. They said, yeah, send it to me. And I said to her, how much time do you think you'll be donating or dedicating to this, this segment of a rebuttal? And she said, maybe three or four minutes. So by the time I got on, they did something that was probably the first time ever in the show, before or since. They dedicated an entire episode of one hour on the Monsanto cancer thing, had me on it, had Brent Wisner on it, had the plaintiff on it, and we kicked butt. <laughs> they invited Donna, but Donna Farmer refused. Monsanto sent a two-paragraph explanation, which said over the air, and so we, we totally won the, won the uh, audience over with that one. Some examples of what Donna Farmer said in private to another Monsanto person. You cannot say that Roundup is not a carcinogen. We have not done the necessary testing on the formulation to make that statement. William Haydens, in an email to Donna Farmer, says, we're in pretty good shape with glyphosate, but vulnerable on the surfactants that it's the, glyphosate is okay, but the formulated product, which is Roundup, and thus the surfactant, does the damage. Oops. And William Hayden's to Donna as well. The surfactant of the formulation will come up in the tumor promotion skin study because we think it played a role there. In other words, promoting tumors. There was one study where they put uh, Roundup on the, on the shaved skin of rodents and 40% of them got tumors, and none of the control groups. And then another one. Terry, Donna, and I reviewed the mortality data. It's not outside the realm of possibilities that the three deaths were treatment related. And then she, you could see that she was given an article to ghostwrite. And she went and edited it. You could see where she struck things out. Here's a perfect sentence. Instead Saying, overall, although the results are suggestive, they fail to demonstrate a significant association of glyphosate exposure with the risk of spontaneous abortion, miscarriage. And it now appears, after her edit, overall the results fail to demonstrate a significant association. So she took out that the results are suggestive. And then she took her name off the paper, and Monsanto's name off the paper, after contributing. And that's how it got published. So this is, I mean, this was gold. To get millions of pages like this was absolutely fantastic. And they, they talked about the full formulation and they, they, they were given all sorts of suggestions from Dr. Parry to do studies on the full formulation. And they did a little study on, on absorption ability. And they take cadavers and they put it on the cadaver, and it was getting in there about 10%, which is 3.3 times the allowable level. And so they said it could blow the Roundup risk evaluation, and they're getting a much higher dermal penetration than we've ever seen before because of those surfactants. And then we have another, another email that says, we dropped the program for glyphosate evaluation of the absorption, including the surfactants, because a further study would not likely to, but not, not, was not likely to help us meet 
project objective. The project objective was to get it approved. If they had revealed, if they had turned over the data to the EPA about what they got, it would not have been approved. So they did not, they just stopped doing further research studies. And in this third trial, a toxicologist who had studied it dropped the bombshell. They did, in fact, turn over absorption studies to the EPA. They took cadaver skin and they cut it out and they baked it in an oven, then they froze it. Then they put Roundup on it and hardly anything got absorbed and that's what they reported. I loved these things. To me, these are like, this is gold for an activist. It's, I remember talking to Dr. Arpad Pustai. I hadn't published my book yet. And I read somewhere else that he was burglarized and his research notes were, st were stolen. Now, I had interviewed him longer than anyone else in the world for hours and hours. I passed everything that I had written back to him to make sure it was accurate. I called him up and said, Arpad, you didn't tell me you were burglarized. He said, I didn't think it was important. I said, Arpad, this is great news. <laughs> because these are the kind of stories that tell you who we're dealing with and why we cannot trust them with anything, especially our children. There's a research study by Dr. Seralini that what he did is he was a toxicologist on the French committee that evaluated the submissions by the biotech industry for their GMOs. And he noted that all their corn fed rat submissions had serious issues and in just, in just 90 days. In the Roundup Ready Corn example, there were over 50 statistically significant differences suggesting uh, signs of toxicity in the liver and kidneys. And so he decided to do his own research, but not for 90 days, for two years. And not just doing the small number of tests that Monsanto got away with, but doing a whole bank of tests. And he found that in the two years, starting in the fourth month, right after Monsanto ends its studies in 90 days, the rats started to get tumors. And by the end of the study, they had multiple massive tumors, which you can see on the earlier. Monsanto got me, okay. They died, they had premature death, and they had organ damage to the liver, kidneys, pituitary, and in some cases, hormone damage. And what they did in this study was they wanted to find out whether it was the Roundup or the corn, or the Roundup and the corn. So on the left side, it's a rat from the study that had just eaten the Roundup ready corn that had never been sprayed with Roundup. On the right side, it's a rat where the Roundup was in the drinking water, but they didn't eat the GMO corn, they ate natural corn. And in the middle, it was the Roundup ready corn that had been sprayed with Roundup. All three groups had multiple massive tumors, early death, and organ damage. So it was the Roundup alone, the GMO alone, and in combination that caused these problems. It was First, the most, the most in-depth animal feeding study ever conducted prior to this was from Dr. Arpad Pustai, who discovered inherent dangers. And this was the next. This became the most in-depth study, two years. And immediately, immediately, Dr. Seralini got hammered. Within 24 hours, before the built time that scientists could actually read and evaluate and develop a response, they were circulating talking points to all of their front groups and all of their front scientists, sending it to the, to the papers, saying the same thing, and then at a certain point when so many of their own people said the same thing, they declared it a consensus. And one of the things they said was, he used the wrong rats. The rats were prone to cancer. But it was the same rats that Monsanto used in their study. He took Monsanto studies and just extended it for two years. They said, oh, there's not enough rats in the control group. It was the same number of rats in the control group of the Monsanto study. He just extended it for two years. Then they said, these rats, because about 80 to 90% of the rats eating the GMOs and Roundup got 
tumors. And they said, in our studies, even the control group, 80%, 90% get, get tumors. So there might, there's no statistical difference when you compare it to historical controls. This is one of their methods they use to rig research. But there was only about 10% of the rats in Seralini's study that had tumors. So what, how do you explain that? So, and I had been advocating for this for a long time, they gathered, my Seralini's team, they gathered lab chow, rat chow, mice chow, from all over the world and tested it. And they found that the control groups which were eating this chow were eating food that contained GMOs and Roundup. So in all of their scientific studies, pairing animals that were purposely fed GMOs and Roundup to animals that were also fed GMOs and Roundup. So no wonder the Sprague Doily, Sprague Doily rats in their study, 80% to 90% got cancer or tumors because they were feeding them GMOs and Roundup and other pesticides and heavy metals in the rat chow. So it turns out that Seralini's methods were actually impeccable. I mean, they could have done some things better, but they clearly showed that GMOs should be taken off the market. And he won a, a federal whistleblower award, but he really never got the impact that his study deserved because of the massive disinformation campaign. And again, the materials made public from the lawsuit show some of the inside story. So David Saltmiras, who was that person that ghost wrote some of the stories, he, he, he boasted that he successfully facilitated numerous third party letters to the editor meaning he wrote them and had other people sign them. And that he described it as the last rites for Seralini's few remaining shreds of credibility. They also um, asked Bruce Chassie. He's the guy that they pay to go after me. He created a whole website against me, which misquoted my book and then challenged my book. Um, he, I talked to Bruce Chassie, and he will send a letter to Wally Hayes directly and notify other scientists Wally Hayes was the editor of the journal that published Seralini. And he basically says, pushing it out, and he said, I remain adamant that Monsanto must not be put in the position of providing the critical analysis. In other words, it must be third parties. And then Bruce Chassie, to Wallace Hayes, my intent was to urge you to roll back the clock, retract the paper, and start a new review process. And then we find out that Wallace Hayes then became hired by Monsanto, paid $400 an hour as their consultant, and that one of Monsanto's scientists had been brought on as the biotech associate editor for this journal. And then guess what? They retracted the study. They retracted the study and described about three or four reasons why they retracted it. And one was it wasn't conclusive. Now, alert scientists said, if we apply those criteria to all of the studies that you normally publish, one third of them would be taken away. Furthermore, there's published reasons why, criteria why you retract a study, and this fills none of them. So, the flushed Wallace Hayes wrote another one saying, well, there wasn't enough rats to constitute a cancer study. They never used the word cancer in the study. It was a toxicological study. They were surprised about the tumors. They never made a conclusion about cancer. So Wallace Hayes absolutely did not know what he was talking about. And he was obviously bought by industry. Fortunately, soon after it was retracted, it was republished by another peer-reviewed journal. And they, so Wallace Hayes' group peer-reviewed it twice. This journal peer-reviewed it. So it passed three peer reviews and remains intact. It was interesting, I was reading the final arguments of the third trial for Monsanto, and my name comes up. And it's, a, it's an email from one Monsanto executive to another, any subject title, whack-a-mole. And they're talking about how I, published an article about how GMOs were more dangerous to children, and they were telling Bruce Chassie to go after me. 
And they said, you know, Jeff said it again. That was the quote from their email. And the response by the other Monsanto executives was, funny you should use the word whack-a-mole. Donna Farmer and I started using that two years ago in our responses. So I'm part of the whack-a-mole campaign from Monsanto. You know, if you don't, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm a, a whack-a-mole. And uh, it, whack a mole is a is a arcade game where a mole comes up and then you hit it as hard as you can and as fast as you can with a mallet, and then another one comes up and you hit it with a mallet, and another one comes up, and if you can knock as many down as you you can gain, gain points and keep your glyphosate on the market, that's how it is in the arcade games. And I want to now tell you why you must change your diet and. I told you at the beginning that if you really want to know why, watch the movie Secret Ingredients. And my first, my earlier um, full-length documentary, Genetic Roulette, is also available in the lobby. That convinces, it's convinced more people to avoid eating GMOs than any other movie. But I did not mention in that movie that Roundup was also sprayed on grapes, rice, fruit, vegetables, wheat, soybeans, corn, actually all the grains, all the beans, and the res glyphosate are higher in oats and beans than in soybeans because they spray it just before harvest as a desiccant to dry down the crop. It forces fast ripening of the grain, and it's right in the food that we eat. So I used to have oatmeal as a safe non-GMO food. Oatmeal is never genetically engineered. So when I'd go and speak at conferences like this and I'd go to the, the, the breakfast, I'd have oatmeal. But I now never touch the oatmeal because it's high level of glyphosate. Same with wheat, unfortunately. Wheat is glyphosate right before harvest. And organic is not. So organic wheat, I would eat organic, if, if I ate wheat, organic oats, organic beans, hummus, so, uh, chickpeas. No, even if it's non-GMO, even non-GMO bread, non-GMO wheat bread could be sprayed with Roundup. So that's why it's important to eat organic. And as you'll see in the film, Secret Ingredients, and I'll be out there in a few minutes to sell copies, and then I have to go off to a theater to show it and answer questions in Port Washington, you'll see that when you change your diet to non-GMO and organic, you're no longer being exposed to the chemical that Monsanto worked so hard to hide the evidence from, and the GMOs that they did the same thing for. And you realize that it is bashing your system, and it may be the driver of the particular chronic diseases that you and your family are suffering from. So please switch to organic, take notes, see how your energy level is, your health, your symptoms, your mood, make that change, and then tell everyone you know about it. No, GMO seeds are grown organically. Organic does not allow GMOs intentionally. GMOs are not allowed in organic. Glyphosate is not allowed in organic. Sometimes there is occasionally fraud, more often drift, but it's usually only a small percentage. Actually, I can't take questions now because my time is up. The, the light is flashing red. I will be able to answer questions while I'm at the booth, the, the table over there. And tomorrow, I speak about an existential threat where if we're not careful, the new gene editing could replace nature in this generation so that all future generations will instead instead of inheriting the products of the billions of years of evolution, will inherit products of laboratory creations whose number one most common result is surprise side effects, a formula for a cataclysm. And we want you to know about this so we can stop it. Thank you all very much for my storytelling opportunity.